Hi, my name is Kristen Masco, and I lead the mental health and well being team here at Google. We're thrilled to have all of you with us here for our discussion today. Uh, so, May is Mental Health Month, and we are very excited to have Marissa Renee Lee with us to discuss her book, Grease, Grief is Love Living with Loss. In her book, Marissa reveals that healing does not mean moving on, healing means learning to acknowledge and create space for your grief forever. Marissa guides the reader through the pain of grief, whether you lost the person recently or long ago. She shows you what it looks like to honor your loss on your unique terms, and she debunks the idea of grief stages or timelines. Living with loss requires you to learn how to love yourself and the one you lost with the same depth, passion, joy, and commitment that you did when they were alive, perhaps even more. At its core, Grief is Love explores what comes after death and shows us that if we can honor what we've lost, we can have a beautiful and joyful life in the midst of grief. Marissa Renee Lee is a called upon advocate, writer, and speaker on coping with grief. She is a rabble rouser of social healing. She is a former appointee in the Obama White House, former managing director of My Brother's Keeper Alliance, the CEO of Beacon Advisors, co-founder of the digital platform Supportal, and founder of The Pink Agenda a national organization dedicated to raising awareness and money for breast cancer care, research, and awareness. Marissa was recognized in the Chronicle of Philanthropies 40 Under 40, and she was named a member of the Ebony Power 100, amongst other community crusaders that she greatly admires. In 2018, she was a contributing author to the book Modern Loss, a series of candid stories and illustrations on grief. In addition, she has been a, fe a featured speaker on several forums, including South by Southwest. Marissa has also written op-eds on race, opportunity, economic mobility, and grief for CNN, Bustle, Option B, News One, and other outlets. And she is a regular contributor to Glamour, Vogue, MSNBC, and CNN. Uh, so for all of you listening, please feel free to add your questions to the YouTube chat as we go through the conversation because we'll save um, the second part of our time for your questions. And with that, let's welcome Marissa Renee Lee. Yay, thank you Hi. so much for having me, Kristen and Team Google. I love it. Absolutely, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate you taking the time um, to tell us about your book. And I loved your book. Uh, <laughs> I just thought it was just a beautifully open and honest uh, description of, of what it really feels like to go through, to go through grief. And was wondering to kick us off um, can you tell people, you know, what, what losses, what events in your life inspired you to write this book? Yes. So I decided to write this book almost 14 years ago. It was August of 2008. And my mom, Lisa, had been dead for six months. And I found when I was doing the research for this book, a journal entry where I wrote, I'm going to write a book about grief that won't just be sad and depressing, and that will be a New York Times bestselling book. Because obviously, why not set a ridiculous, ambitious goal on something that I'd never done before in my life? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, you know, in that moment, I remember feeling angry. And I felt angry because it seemed like I had been sold a lie about grief. You know, my my mom fought breast cancer for almost three years. Before that, she had multiple sclerosis. She was a very sick person for a very long time. And so, you know, I was prepared for her death. I knew it was coming. You know, even at a young age, I was in my early 20s when she passed away. I read the books. I did the research as much as you could Google back then in 2008 about death and dying and end of life. I had the spreadsheet with what she wanted done with her stuff and, you know, what she wanted for her funeral and, and all of the things. And then when it actually happened at 5.37 p.m. on February 28th, she laughed at something I shared with her, collapsed, had a seizure and was gone. And I was lost. You know, I thought that I knew what to expect. I thought that I had done the work to prepare myself. And instead I felt a devastation, like nothing I had ever experienced in my life up to that point. 
And I spent the first six months feeling like there was something wrong with me. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I must be doing it wrong. Like there are supposed to be these five stages. And, you know, as we got further and further away from the funeral, I was still having such a hard time and, you know, battling depression and anxiety, even as I was back at work and back to running my charity on the side, I knew I wasn't okay. Like I was having a really hard time. And finally, around that six month mark, I just decided, and I don't know what led to this decision, but I decided that there wasn't anything wrong with me and that the real problem was in how we talked about and treated grief. You know, these ideas about getting over it and moving on just didn't make sense to me. And so I decided, you know, in that moment, wrote it down in my journal that I was going to write this book. Um, But it took a pregnancy loss in 2019 to actually kind of push me over the edge to start thinking about what this book might look like and how I define grief in my life. You know, for folks who know me personally, and I know there are a few former Obama colleagues and neighbors and friends uh, watching this chat, I'm known for having fun and, you know, super vibrant, joyful life. You know, I'm the one who wants to be with you celebrating something big that's happened in your life. I want to be at the party. Like, I believe in having a good time, but I also believe in honoring your grief and being open and honest about the harder parts of life. And, you know, when I found myself on the bathroom floor, physically losing this pregnancy that we had worked so hard to create and that we held so much hope for. All I wanted in the world was my mom, you know, a woman who had been dead for over a decade at that point. And so I had to write, you know, I was physically ill from the pregnancy loss, completely devastated, once again, feeling just lost and unmoored in my grief with no plan for how my husband and I would move forward to grow our family. And I just, I wrote and I wrote and I wrote and ultimately an article that was published in Glamour Mother's Day weekend, 2020 about not getting over it and Mm -hmm. my commitment to not getting over it. And the fact that I just, I didn't believe in that, that I don't think that that's how grief works, that I don't think that's how love works went viral and it turned into the book that you recently read. Wow. And I really hope that it helps people feel less alone and dismantles some of these very dated and I think harmful ideas about grief and loss. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And just the, you know, as, as people read the book, just the honesty of, of, the, of you describing your experience is just, it's very, very beautifully written and, and very honest. Thank you. Thank you for sharing it. Um, and one of the things that you just touched on is um, there are just so many different forms of grief. And so in your book, you write a lot about, you know, losing your mother, losing the pregnancy. Um, and we know there's just so many different, I think a lot of people throughout the pandemic have been experiencing various forms of grief, like grief of, of, of a lost identity, loss of a yep. job, a divorce, you know, parents having their children go to college. Like there's so yeah. many different forms of grief. And I think so often by like, one of the things I really loved about your book is you talk about this idea of just the power in naming it and the, the power in saying, this is what I'm feeling. I'm feeling a loss. I'm feeling grief. And, and I think there's so much additional pain we sort of invoke on ourselves by just not acknowledging um, the, the, the losses and the, and the grief that we're all going through. And so I really appreciated how throughout your book, you, you kind of referenced a few different types of grief. And then that kind of helps people to extrapolate for whatever the loss might, might be in, in their own Exactly. Mind. Exactly. Yeah. I had a friend, one of my closest friends, um, just text me two days ago that in the aftermath of reading my book, she realized that as a young child, she experienced grief when her parents got divorced. Mm -hmm. You know, she was eight years old and she said, suddenly she and her mother were moving to a new place without her dad. And to her, it seemed like this change that had happened overnight. And, you know, as an adult, she obviously assumes there was a lot going on that she was not privy to. But, you know, for an eight-year-old child to one day be moving with your mother without your father, like that can cause tremendous grief. And I hope that, I hope that people will 
give themselves permission to feel grief, to identify it in the various ways that it comes up in life, because you're right, it's not just something that is connected to a death. Like, yes, that is the grief that I write a lot about in the book, but there is grief and loss that can be experienced in so many different life events. And when we give ourselves the opportunity to identify and acknowledge and name these difficult emotions, that is actually how we reduce their power over us. Yeah. And I think people often expect the opposite. Mm -hmm. You know, if I acknowledge this grief, if I acknowledge all of this sadness, I'm going to be overwhelmed by it. And it's just going to take over everything yeah. when really the opposite is true. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that. Um, so um, actually, maybe let's start with like, you know, I think there's this very kind of cookie cutter image of what grief is going to look like. So someone's going to pass away and I'm, we're going to have the funeral and everyone's going to be really sad. And then we're going to progressively feel better over the next few months until everything's yeah. back to normal. There's kind of, I'm exaggerating, but I think there's that, that very sort of simplistic view that, that society 100%. has of, about grief. Um, and I would love just, just for the, I'm sure there are people on the call who are in the middle of this right now and who are, who are going through grief. Um, I think would you be able to share just to kind of help normalize it? Like what was your, how did your experience differ from that kind of very cookie cutter example of grief? Um, would love to just share that just to help normalize it with, with people who are going through it. Yeah. So I, I want people to think about grief less as, you know, this thing that progresses in a very specific and sequential way and more as a lived experience. You know, I redefine grief in the book as the repeated experience of learning to live in the midst of a significant loss. And just to get specific, because I do think it helps to have real examples from my life. Um, I have a really hard time in February. Every year I struggle in February because February 18th is my mom's birthday. And then she died 10 days later. And there is, there is something known as cellular memory. And, and I always thought the further that I got from her death, the less that those dates would impact me, but that hasn't actually proven to be true. They're still hard. Yeah. So I plan to take those days off from work every year. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whether you're a client or someone who wants to hire me for a speaking engagement or whatever, like I am not available on February 18th. I'm not available on February 28th. And that is what works for me in terms of a coping mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, another example, when I went to get married, you know, when you lose someone you love, you expect these big milestones, you know, marriage, children, graduations, new jobs, et cetera, to hit a little differently. Mm -hmm. And what you sometimes don't expect are for events around them to also hit a little differently. Like my wedding day was perfect. I felt my mom's presence there. I had a great time from start to finish, which you know involved me eating leftover pasta in like a walk-in refrigerator at 3 a.m. Like I had a blast, but I really struggled with wedding planning. Um, my mom and I were always organizing holidays and birthdays and 4th of July parties and things like that together as a kid. And so she, I realized, you know, after picking a fight with my fiance and just generally being a bit of a mess, I realized that I was grieving, you know, not having the only other person around who would really care about every single minute detail as much as me. You know, my fiance, now husband, love him so much. He's a wonderful, perfect human being. But like, did he care about the custom invitations that I had made with a vintage map of the Hudson Valley? Like, no, he didn't. Um, and so, you know, giving ourselves the opportunity to identify these different places where it comes up and not beat ourselves up for it, you know, yeah. not judge ourselves for it, but instead say, oh, right, this is that grief thing again. Ugh, you know, it's annoying, it's inconvenient, but when we acknowledge it, we really do make it easier. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That was very well said. Um, and I do think there's this, uh, and you're right about this, that there's this societal component. Like I think in our society, 
we can have this idea that the goal in life is to be happy all the time. Yes. And any anytime we're not happy, something's wrong and we have to fix it like ASAP, right? Yeah, it's your so, fault. Yeah, it's your fault. And so, you know, and and you know, with with grief or any other different, you know, anger, like any other difficult difficult emotion, there can kind of be this sense of like something's broken and I need to really fix it quickly. And then when you're going through a grief experience, you, you're, you know, as you describe really um eloquently in the book, you're experiencing so many different, you oh. know, the anger, the resentment, the sadness, like just so many different overwhelming um, negative emotions. And one of the things that you write about is like the fear that if you feel, if you start to feel those emotions, you're going to get sucked in and never come back. Yep. And you're learning about how, how to engage with those emotions to kind of go through them. And could you talk with people a little bit about that? Cause I think that's such a common fear that like, if I start to feel this, there's yeah. no bottom and I'm just going to go down and I'm never going to come I'm back done. up. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I want to, I want to respond to a couple of things that you said. Yeah. I love all of it. You know, I do think the dominant sort of culture in, our country is to pull yourself up by your emotional bootstraps yeah. and get yourself to a place of feeling better immediately. The second, the tiniest sliver of, you know, a quote negative emotion arises. And one of the things that I learned in the research for grief is love is that as human beings, we are born with off the top of my head, it's either five or six innate emotions that like you are just expected to experience mm -hmm. as a normal, well-developed human being from birth. And more than half of those emotions are things that we have labeled as bad. You know, it's mm -hmm. sadness, it's anger, disgust, and fear. And how can we label them as bad if they're things that we were born to experience? And so I just want to encourage people to like let go of that judgment that is so often tied to those emotions because I just I just don't think that it's helpful. And when these feelings arise, you know, even after writing this book and all the grief that I've lived with the last 14 years, I still get nervous and worried and fearful of the feelings when they come. Um, just to give a specific example, you know, after a lot of struggle with infertility and pregnancy loss, my husband and I adopted a baby last summer. And thank so God. this past weekend, thank you, thank you. This past weekend was my first Mother's Day and I'm in the middle of this book tour. I had a big event in DC Saturday afternoon and I just woke up in like the worst funk Saturday morning. And my husband kept being like, are you okay? Like what's going on? And the whole time I'm like, I'm fine. I'm fine. You know, basically like stop asking me questions. And then fast forward to it's time to get ready for the event. And I realize, you know, I have mixed feelings about Mother's Day and I probably will forever because while I'm happy to take a day off and be celebrated and spoiled and everything else, I miss my mom. And, you know, I spent 25 years celebrating her for Mother's Day. And so it just... It's just a lot of emotions and also just being worn out from talking about grief every day, yeah. multiple times a day for the last month. And he found me crying like mm. full hysterically in the shower yeah. and was like, oh my God, are you okay? Like, are you going to be able to get it together to do this event that's happening in 90 minutes? Mm -hmm. And I had a moment where I was like, oh my God, am I going to be able to get it together? And then of course, like, the, you get the feelings out, you have the cry, and it actually ends up being more cathartic and helpful. And, you know, crying in the shower is a great place to cry because you come out, you're all cleaned up and fresh faced, throw on some makeup and was able to do the event. And I think, I think I actually showed up more authentically yeah. to that event because I had that experience of having to deal with my own grief that day. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. And just this idea that like, if it, like it, they, if you let them pass through you, they, they, your emotions kind of move through versus if you, if, if, if they're held up, it can cause so many other problems. So yeah. yeah. The only guarantee yeah. about feelings is that they are temporary. Mm. Like ask any therapist, they will tell you the same thing. I promise I've been in and out of therapy for a long time. <laughs> and, and even just, just think about like your happiest times. Yeah. Like, am I the only person that gets a little bit of a, 
little bit of a joy hangover after their birthday or after Christmas, you know, like you have the big high of the celebration and then you're like, oh man, now what? Um, and so think about the sad, you know, more challenging emotions in the same way. Like it's not, it's not going to be with you forever, but you, you got to go through it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And so that would be your advice to someone who's, is this, I think it's such a common feeling. Like I just oh, don't yeah. want to go there is like, it's, no. it, you're going to come out the other end and just, yes. just go through it, express the emotion and you'll come out the other side. hundred percent. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, and so there's a passage I wanted to read from your book. Uh, so one of the things that you, we just talked a lot about how important this space of vulnerability and feeling your emotions mm -hmm. and being able to sh experience them yourself, experience them with friends and loved ones, just how fundamental that is as a part of the healing process. And in your book, you write about how that place of vulnerability is not equally distributed in our society. And I want to read this passage for, for those listening. Vulnerability requires a sense of safety that is not equally distributed in our society. Some people are too busy to be vulnerable. Some of us are too female, too poor, too gay, or too black for vulnerability. When my mom died, I did not feel safe enough, stable enough to just let go and truly be vulnerable. I could not afford to fall apart. I've come to recognize that we struggle hardest when we don't feel protected. This often makes grief tougher for people of color, Black people in particular, because the safety that vulnerability requires is so much harder to access. How can you grieve when you can't breathe? How can you grieve when you are still forced to argue that your life matters? And so I would love to just hear your thoughts on how you, how your identity as a Black woman impacted your grieving and, and this access to vulnerability societally. Yeah, so it's really funny. I started thinking about vulnerability and what it means and sort of, you know, who is celebrated for being vulnerable when I was celebrated for being vulnerable in the wake of our pregnancy loss. My husband and I had been very open about our infertility journey. It felt important to us to just tell the truth as, you know, people who have an opportunity to have a platform to share what we were going through in the hopes of, you know, hopefully helping others who might be experiencing the same thing and, and, you know, don't feel comfortable sharing. And so when the loss happened, you know, we told everybody. And for me, it was, it was less about, you know, being an example out in the world and more about, frankly, doing what was practically easiest and healthiest for me. Like I continued to have health challenges following our loss for months and months. And as someone who is like very out there in the world, you know, running my own business, constantly engaging with people, like I needed people to know the truth so that when there were times when I, I couldn't show up either because I was dealing with my grief or dealing with some of the physical stuff, I wasn't going to lie about that. Like that just didn't feel right to me. And so yeah. put it all out there, you know, wrote articles, put it on social media, everything. And I got a lot of feedback from people praising me for being vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And I remember feeling uncomfortable with that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you go to write a book like this, you have to unpack a lot of stuff. And so this became one of those things that I felt like I needed to unpack. And I realized I felt uncomfortable being described as vulnerable because I was in a place where I didn't have to care about what other people thought of me. So of course I could be vulnerable. You know, I was as successful as can be, you know, and as safe as one could be as a black woman in America, you know, running a successful business, starting charities and other projects, working for President Obama, working on Wall Street, like I had all of the things. And so, you know, if someone wanted to judge me for sharing too much, for being too sensitive or too emotional or whatever, I just I didn't have to care. Right. But then I started to think about, you know, why couldn't I be this way when I lost my mom? Because back then I did have to care. You know, I wasn't an established person in the world. I didn't have the financial resources to take as much time off from work as I maybe wanted to or needed to. I didn't have 
this sense of emotional or psychological safety at work that I did, you know, now all these years later that I'm running my own business and, you know, doing my own thing out in the world. And I started asking all these questions about vulnerability and, you know, what, what does it mean? What does it look like to be vulnerable emotionally if you've already been made vulnerable by society? And I realized that because, you know, we're, we live in a country that lacks a real social safety net and because we live in a country where things like racism and gender discrimination and homophobia exist. There are people who can't afford the privilege of vulnerability. You know, like I think about LGBTQ parents in Texas and Florida, given what's going on in those states right now, you know, like they, they don't get to be vulnerable because they're worried about keeping their kids safe. You know, I think about the images that we saw of, you know, mothers writing contact information on their children's backs in Ukraine, you know, as they prepare to try and flee the country, like they don't have time to grieve. That's, that's, that's just not an option for them. And so I think it's really important in conversations about grief and mental health more broadly, that we make sure to ask these questions around access and privilege and equity so that we all do our part to create spaces where everyone, you know, no matter their life circumstances, has the opportunity to be vulnerable and ultimately to access the resources that they need to heal. Yeah, yeah. You know, that just is so beautifully said that um, it's just this like really fundamental human right that is needed for healing and for emotional health to be vulnerable and that it's not equally distributed. And anything that we can do um, as a society or individuals to increase that space for vulnerability. Um, It's a really good point. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about your relationships with with other people. So like your Mm -hmm. husband and your friend, you wrote a lot about grace and it, you, uh, it was, maybe you can uh, tell us a little bit about your distinction between grace and forgiveness. But um, yes. there was one passage I wanted you to reference, which is, which is um, you wrote that grace is about giving someone permission to return to a sacred place with you, a vulnerable place. It is the act of welcoming someone back from a mistake, letting them in over and over again and acknowledging how imperfect we all are. And I just thought there were some very beautiful descriptions in the book of how you've done that with your friends, with your husbands, had people do that with you. And would just love for people to kind of hear that um, because I think there can be a lot of, um, people can be hard on themselves and hard on each other. Um, And so would love just your thoughts on grace and forgiveness. Yeah, so my thoughts on grace are heavily influenced by a specific story and relationship that I'll just share a little bit about. Um, One of my roommates from college, she and I, you know, we were first matched together freshman year. We lived together all four years, best of friends, close with each other's families, you know, all of the things. Uh, She didn't show up for my mom's funeral. Her parents were there, but she wasn't there. To be fair to her, at the time she was playing for the Irish women's national soccer team in Europe. And uh, they had a game, you know, the day of my mom's funeral in Portugal. Um, so that like, you know, in retrospect, I, I can see why she felt like, you know, that'll be a time when you'll be well supported. I'm going to show up, you know, weeks, months later when people have frankly forgotten that you lost your mom. That was her logic. That was her rationale. But when she shared this with me, you know, two days after my mom died, I was just like, well, we're not friends anymore. And like, that was it. I, I in my mind, I, you know, I, I know exactly where I was standing at, you know, everything. I was like, I'm writing you off for life. Like you're a terrible person. She worked so hard to be, you know, let back into my good graces. And I found that I, I needed to let her back in, you know, that I didn't want that relationship to be something else that I was grieving. Um, But it was only through, you know, her hard work and effort and commitment to loving me, even when I was like, no, thank you. (laughs) Um, That led to us continuing to be the best of friends. You know, we just spent Easter together with our families. Her daughter was in my wedding. Like the relationship has been thoroughly repaired to the extent that I use her name in the book and share this story and she's totally fine with it. 
Um, but I think that I think that I realized through that situation, that relationship that, you know, if we're going to assume that grief is for life, which at this point, that is my assumption 14 years out. If someone else has learned differently, please yeah. let me know. We need to leave room for error. You know, we're all yeah. fallible. We're all going to make mistakes. We are going to make mistakes in terms of our ability to show up for others when our grief unexpectedly shows up and leaves us, you know, incapacitated, bawling in the shower. Other people are going to make mistakes when they try to show up for us because grief is tricky and complicated and it's really hard to know how to show up. We are also going to be needing of grace from others. And so when you think about grief as a lifelong thing, there needs to be room for grace. And the way I differentiate grace and forgiveness is, you know, forgiveness is you recognizing that someone else, whether it was intentional or not, did something to hurt you. And you choose to forgive them for the sake of letting it go and moving on and no longer holding on to that hurt. But when you forgive them, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're let back in. Grace is when we realize that someone who loves us and cares for us deeply has made a mistake, has done the work, you know, has shown how much they really do love us, has made an effort to be let back in and like you choose to let them back in. And I, I thought about this, you know, both in the context of the situation with my roommate from college, but also you always hear, or at least I've heard a few times in other people's speeches and in sermons at church, I want to say something like over 70% of arguments in marriages are the same argument, you know, some version of the same argument over and over again, which is horrifying to think about. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I'm almost 11 years into my relationship with my husband. It's definitely true. You know, like I, you can like predict it now, I almost like see it coming and I try to avoid it, but it usually still happens anyway. And it's being able to continue to be in relationship with people who really do love you in that way where you can continue to forgive this thing that they do that drives you crazy and they can continue to do the same. Like it applies in marriages and other partnerships, but it also applies in grief, I think. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um. And then I wanted to talk a little bit about kind of your ongoing relationship with the person you loved after, after they're gone. So either your relationship with that person, your internal life. Um, and there's two components that it, of, of this that you brought up. So one was this idea that when you lose someone, you're losing that person, but then you're also losing the ways in which they supported you and loved you and cared for you. Um, and so maybe we can start with that one. Like, can you talk a little bit about um, how you worked, how you worked, and how you would suggest other people to work through? Um, I don't want to say replacing, but kind of identifying like what is that source of love that that person gave you, and and how can you move forward with that? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So, uh, one thing I just want to share for context: when I was working on this book, um, my husband, bless his heart, said why should people buy your book? Like what makes you a grief expert? And I said to him at the time, you know, I actually don't want to be a grief expert. Like, I don't know what that is because if you were to drop dead tomorrow, I'm pretty sure every lesson I've learned, everything that the loss of my mother has taught me will just fly out the window and people will have to pick me up off the floor. Um, but I said, you know, I want to lift up the people who are actually experts, you know, the folks who are doing the research on bereavement, on grief in the body and the brain and what the healthiest coping mechanisms are and all of those things. And so everything that I share in the book is supported by the leading research around grief and loss. And my sort of overarching thesis that you do continue your relationship with your loved one after you lose them, that that love doesn't die. You know, it, it has made a permanent imprint on your brain and you need to figure out how to continue to love them in the present tense is supported by this theory called the continuing bonds theory, which basically states that the healthiest way to 
live with and you know cope with the most devastating losses is to find a way to continue your bond with that person in the present. And so for me, the support piece of it is, you know, my mom was the best encourager. You know, I will never forget, I was a little kid, gosh, I don't know, maybe five years old. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. But I said to her, when I grow up, I want to be an actress and a lawyer. Like those seemed like totally compatible career choices. <laughs> I love it. And she said, okay, well, both of those careers will require you to do a lot of reading. So you should read a lot of books. And I'm sure at the time she was thinking like, how do I get this kid to stop asking me questions and like go do something quiet? <laughs> but it stuck with me as like that practical encouragement. And that's who she was always. I learned, I learned just a couple of weeks ago when I did a bookstore event with one of my childhood friends who is a journalist now. And, she, and in the interview with her, she mentioned that when I was a junior in high school and I got really sick with mono and I was, of course, also running for class president for the fourth time, that it was my mom who rallied my childhood, you know, high school girlfriends and guy friends to run my campaign, you know, on my behalf. Mm -hmm. um, so like she was just very good at encouraging and supporting in very practical ways. Mm -hmm. She was also just known for comforting people. You know, mm -hmm. so many of my childhood friends, you know, my college friends, obviously lots of folks in my family had their own special and unique relationship with her because she was just a very comforting person. And so for me, when I have moments where I'm like, oh my God, you know, I really miss my mom right now. I've been trying to take it a step further and ask myself, you know, what do I need? Like, wow. do I miss my mom because she's the person I could complain to about how tired I am? Because for some reason, my kid's been waking up at 5 a.m. the last three mornings. Like, is that like, do I just need a nap or do I need to complain to somebody else about the fact that I'm tired just to like get it out and acknowledge it? Um, you know, am I actually feeling sad about something completely different, you know, that has nothing to do with my grief, but that is making me long for that comfort and support? You know, am I feeling antsy or anxious about something? And I want to be able to talk to her about it. But I, since I can't really talk to her, I mean, I talk to her all the time, but like, I don't, I don't get a ton of words back, obviously. Um, you know, do I need to just like go for a walk and get some fresh air or hop on my Peloton? You know, what is it that is going on? Or what is it that I can do for myself, given she's not here? Yeah. You know, because like I can, I can always feel and access her love. Like that is never, that is never missing for me in my life. Like I am committed to it and I feel it and it's always there. But the thing about grief is, you know, the pain of grief is the pain of unrequited, unconditional love. You know, we can still feel the love that our people have for us that they poured into us throughout their lives but love is both feeling and action and i know my mom still loves me like i know she's super proud that we're having this conversation right now but she can't like do anything for me you know like she's she's not here and so finding ways to accommodate for those loving actions when we miss our people is just practically really helpful when it comes to living with loss yeah, no, that's beautiful. And like using it as this entry point for for self-care and like, what am I really needing right now that I would have gotten from that person and how can I find ways to give that to myself? That's beautiful. Um, so I have one closing question. And then for those of you listening, please do add your questions to the um, YouTube Q&A because we'll move to those next. Um, my closing question is about legacy. And so you, you talked a lot about um, how, like, or maybe tell us, like, how how the traditional definition of legacy differs from how you have experienced it and, and the value that you see in legacy. I think with legacy, we so often get caught up in these external things like the funeral or memorial service or, 
you know, starting a charity in someone's honor or coming up with an award, you know, those things, writing a book. Um, and those things do matter and they definitely have a purpose to serve around, you know, giving us some sense of closure. And I, I think at, at least for, for me, and I'm sure for a lot of you, like having the opportunity to do something that feels, you know, quote unquote productive around a loss, like does help a lot of us heal. But at the end of the day, and I started thinking about this a lot as we watched people lose loved ones during the pandemic that, you know, to be clear, we're still in the midst of, um, and, you know, being forced to host funeral services in parking lots and say farewell via FaceTime or Zoom. You know, we lost my cousin who was 35 and a mother of three very suddenly to COVID. Um, and I watched her brief outdoor memorial service via Facebook Live. Like that, that sucks. And I just felt like a lot of people were robbed of what we typically think of when we think about legacy and memorializing someone. And I realized that my mother's true legacy, you know, it's not this book, it's not the breast cancer nonprofit. It is in how I have been transformed as a person by her life and by her death. It is a deeply internal thing and it is very much about values and how I show up for myself and in the world in a way that honors the values that she instilled in me and the way that she raised me to treat myself and others. You know, mm -hmm. your person's life matters. And it matters even if, you know, you weren't able for any myriad of reasons to do a funeral or a memorial. It matters even if you haven't started a charity or written a book or have like a great grief Instagram or, you know, whatever, yeah. like their life matters because of everything that they poured into you in life mm -hmm. and everything that you learned from their death. Um, yeah. And so I hope people will remember that and, you know, let go of some of the guilt that I think often comes when we aren't able to, you know, perfectly memorialize our loved ones the way that we want to. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And it's just such a beautiful image of that person living on through the ways in which they've changed you and that that is something that will continue um, through generations. So thank you for that. You. Um, and huge thank you for just the conversation. So I want to open it up to the group for any questions um, that, that you all have. Make this a little bit bigger. Yeah. So this is from <laughs> Kenneth. Um, some of those harmful ideas that have been recently codified in the latest DSM as prolonged grief, have you been involved in the response to that? So Kenneth, first of all, that is an excellent question and uh, you will not be surprised to hear it comes up in most of my interviews, just given the timing of the release and the timing of the release of this book. Um, here's what I will say about the DSM and for folks who are not familiar with the DSM, this is the diagnostic manual that psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, et cetera, use to diagnose us when we go for therapeutic help, counseling support, et cetera. Um, and I think it's also important for me to share that in the past, the DSM has been something that has caused people harm. You know, I think it was probably maybe like 60 or so years ago when one of the DSM diagnoses, for instance, was homosexuality. Like that was something that people were expected to go to therapy to fix, which obviously we all know that that's horrendous and just not true. Um, and so I think it's important to just like know what it is and the background behind it. You know, at the end of the day, I know from conversations with friends who are therapists and even with my own therapist that it is challenging and complex when therapists have to work with insurance companies to try and figure out how to capture all of the different things that any of us might be going through that might be helped by, you know, going to therapy and, and sitting with someone and, and working through our challenges in that kind of way. 
Um, and I think we have to acknowledge, and I write about this a bunch in the book, you know, we live in a society that is very committed to capitalism. And at the end of the day, the therapeutic community has to find different ways to be compensated for the care that they provide. Do I think that there will probably end up being people who are, you know, quote, diagnosed with prolonged grief disorder, who are just figuring out how to live with loss and maybe taking a little bit longer than the average? Yes, I absolutely do. And I think it's, I think it's deeply unfortunate. But on the flip side, the the optimist in me is hopeful that having another diagnostic category connected to grief might also enable more people to get help. I, I may be proven wrong, obviously. And that's, you know, just like, that's like my tiny bit of hope that I want to add to all of the concern around it. And, you know, I think that this update happened in large part in response to the pandemic. You know, at this point, a million Americans have been lost to a single thing in just over two years. Hundreds of thousands of children have lost a primary caregiver to COVID. Like we need to make sure that there are as many tools as possible available to support these folks as they learn to live with loss, you know, many of them for the very first time. And I hope that that was the spirit in which this was developed. I, you know, I don't know for sure, but that's, that's my hope as a perennial optimist. Um, but it's, it's, it's definitely challenging. And there are a lot of concerns from those of us in the grief community. You know, I, I don't want people to be further stigmatized in their grief. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a really helpful reframing that it's like, you know, there's sort of the, making it more about this is how people are getting compensated for their work, but it doesn't mean that the experience is abnormal or, or problematic and that it's important that people are seeking that care. Yeah. Okay, David, um, I think I'm suffering from slow burn grief after losing my mom last year. It wasn't super traumatic to me. Am I a monster? <laughs> David, no. You're not a monster. Um, here is the thing about grief, and I am really sorry about your mom. While there are certain components about grief and loss that tend to land in, you know, more common ways for all of us, just based on how our brains respond to the loss, there are a myriad of ways to respond to grief. Like your grief experience is yours alone. And I think the most important thing is just acknowledging it, however it shows up, even if it's not, you know, you crying in the shower like I am, it may just be a subtle, oh, you know, she used to make this recipe and I wish she was here to make it. Like it may be, it may be in different ways, but I think just acknowledging that it's there, even if it feels different and, you know, not exactly how I've described it is really important. And I hope that you won't be hard on yourself just because grief has landed differently for you. And again, no, you are not a monster. Thank you. Maddie says plus 100. And how do you normalize this in the workplace when others haven't gone through it? I lost my sister suddenly in January, and it seems to almost get worse as time goes on. Um, Maddie, first of all, I totally feel you in that experience of feeling like it gets worse as time goes on. You know, that is a lot of what I went through, you know, those first six months after I lost my mom. Like, I felt like a total freak and like there must be something deeply wrong with me. And I'll just share in case this is at all helpful for you. I was back at work two weeks after we buried my mom. Like I felt like that's what I was supposed to do to show that I was moving on and, you know, getting back to life. And, and that's what I thought I should do to make her proud of me. And every day I could, you know, I could manage to get myself together, get myself on the subway. But the second that I started to walk up the stairs at the Wall Street four or five subway station in New York City to do the two and a half block walk to my office, 
I would start having a panic attack and I could hold it together just enough to get into the building and then down to the basement where there was a training center that I knew was only used in the summer months. And I would start my day every day down there in, you know, hysterics for months. And there was one girl who I was also close with at work and she would come down every morning with a latte and a cookie and a Xanax for my desk. I would chat with her for a few minutes, take my medicine, redo my makeup, and then go up to work, you know, on Wall Street, height of the financial crisis, and act like I was totally fine. Um, so I get it and I feel you. And I would say the way that we normalize grief at work is by having conversations like this. And frankly, and, and, I, and I know nothing of any of Google's internal HR policies, but by pushing our leaders and those who are in charge to enact policies that support bereavement. You know, it would have been really helpful, you know, just practical things. Like it would have been really helpful if there was, you know, an affinity group at my bank at the time focused on grief and loss. You know, I knew that there was one other person in my department who had lost someone because she had experienced a very public loss and, you know, found comfort and some sense of community with her. But it would have been nice if there was a larger group where, you know, we could kind of collectively support each other. That that peer to peer support really can make a big difference. It would have been helpful if there were better policies around accessing mental health support, you know, through my company. It would have been great if bereavement leave hadn't solely been contained to a week or two after I lost my mom. You know, I I could have used a vacation those first few months and just a break from everything. You know, it would have been helpful a year after she died to have access to some bereavement leave as I was getting ready to celebrate her first birthday without her on earth, you know, the anniversary of her passing, like things like that. So I think, I think it starts by having these kinds of conversations, elevating the topic of grief and loss and, you know, all of these other mental health challenges that people experience and then pushing for policy change, like both at individual companies and, you know, at local community and, and national government level as well. Thank you. The next question is from Juliana. Um, you spoke about dealing with anger. How did you navigate your anger within grief? Sometimes I feel like I have an inner Hulk trying to burst out of me. That is totally reasonable. Uh, I feel like I keep saying that to people because I want to normalize all of yes. these experiences. Yes. Um, so it's funny, Juliana, my anger didn't become apparent to me and I write about this experience in the book until last summer, you know, so many years after losing my mom, it was last summer, uh, you know, post pregnancy loss, post the loss of my cousin, trying to navigate the complexities and challenges of an adoption process while writing this book and, you know, running my business. I just, I felt this, like constant sense of malaise was the way that I described it to a therapist and she kept poking and prodding and digging. And then finally I was like, I am pissed. And she was like, what are you pissed about? I was like, I am pissed about everything. Like I'm pissed our pregnancy didn't work out. I'm pissed that my mom died and left me with my dad and my sister who are wonderful, but not as awesome as my mom. I am pissed that she's not here to support me as we try and figure out these next steps for our family. Like I'm pissed that we even have to be figuring out these next steps for our family. Like that just doesn't seem fair after I already lost my mom and lost this pregnancy. Like I was like, this is all ridiculous. And I am so angry. And once I started expressing and recognizing that anger, it started to get better. And I know that's what I keep saying about these feelings, but I swear to you, this is what happened. Like I realized it was there. And after feeling frankly guilty about it, you know, like how, how could I be mad at this woman who suffered for 12 years with a combination of multiple sclerosis and breast cancer died and you know even in the midst of all of her illnesses was still focused on 
doing what she could to care for me, to care for my father, to care for my sister, to care for her friends. Like, oh my God, how could I be mad at her? Like that just seemed like really messed up. Like I was like, oh, there's definitely something wrong with me and I'm like going to hell or whatever. Um, and then I learned in the research that anger is a very common element when it comes to grief, especially for bereaved children, but also for bereaved spouses and friends. And once I knew that it was normal, that made me feel a little bit better. And then I also, like for me personally, I had to dig a little bit deeper because I felt, I felt really guilty for holding all of this anger for this woman who I love so much. And I realized that the people who we love unconditionally are also often the people who we are most frequently called to forgive. You know, they mm -hmm. are the people who yeah. drive us the craziest. Like they are the people who know how to upset us, anger us, enrage us, get under our skin the most. And so it was okay that I was angry because of course my mom would forgive me. And I decided that forgiveness doesn't end with death. Mm. Like just like the love doesn't end, the forgiveness doesn't have to end. And so once I went through all of that kind of processing and, and learning that it was normal, it became easier. Are there still times when I'm super angry about all of it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I know that it's okay. And so I say that I'm angry when I get angry and that helps me get over it. Thank you. Thank you. And I think just one of the things that's so powerful about the book throughout is just normalizing all of these emotions, the the yeah. numbness, the anger, the sadness, the jealousy, like just all these things that come up are such a normal part of the process. And the more we can accept them and pass through, uh, let, let it pass through us is really impactful. Mm -hmm. So we're out of time. I, I did want to mm -hmm. say a huge thank you, Marissa. I really, really enjoyed your book and, and this conversation. Um, can you tell everyone on the call how they can find you? How can they find your book? How can they find you yes. Um, online? Yes. So you can find me. I'm Marissa Renee Lee everywhere. Um, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. My website is marissarenaylee.com. I try and keep it as easy as possible. Um, and in terms of where you can find the book, technically you can find the book wherever books are sold, except, and this is a blessing and a curse right now, it is sold out in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. So the number one place where you can find the book currently is at Target. Um, they still have plenty in stock everywhere else. It will be restocked soon. We went into a second printing the first week the book came out. So I think that means it's resonating with folks. So I hope you will either pre-order the next edition or buy it on target and follow along on social media. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you for your time today and just helping to normalize this for ever for everyone listening. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely.